evening, everybody. I'm Jude England, and I'm Head of Research Engagement here at the British Library. And I'm also a member of something called CLOSER, which is the, wait for it, Cohort and Longitudinal Studies Enhancement Resource. And what this is, for those of you who are uh, not involved in it, nor researchers, is um, a consortium of um, organizations of cohorts, so they're cohort studies, and they follow particular groups of people through their lives. So one of them, for example, is the National Survey of Health and Development that's been following people since 1946. So they're going to be 70 next year. And right from birth through to now, and they're still being followed and being asked to do, I sometimes think, unspeakable things, like give blood samples and all sorts of stuff, as well as tell us the stories of their lives. But there are also other ones. There's one that started in 1958. There's one in Hertfordshire that actually goes back and has got people from the 1930s involved in it. And what this group is trying to do is to harmonize, which means make the same the data across the, all these different studies. Because, for example, even how we ask how old people are, how we measure their height, weight, all of those sorts of things, and their social class, their education, differs across time. So trying to get all of that stuff together so we can really look at this huge bundle of wonderful um, sort of legacy data that gets better every year um, is really important. So we're, the British Library and Closer, there's a joint host of tonight's um, event. Um, and what we want to be able to do is to take a look at one of the massive sources of stuff that's coming out of these particular studies, but also a lot of other studies. These are not the only cohort studies um, in the country. But we're looking at um, the secrets of staying sharp in later life. So in short this evening, I think, what we're doing is looking at whether 60 really is the new 50, or even 40 for us all, or whether 60 is more probably the new 70 for at least some of us. Um, and I think my day-to-day -day observation, and our day-to-day -day observation, would suggest that some people age better, or at least differently. I can think of some people I knew in my 20s who, when they were in their 20s, would seem to be comfortably 40, and probably look much the same now. Um, we also have the, the constant refrain as to age being a state of mind. I'm not sure about the state of my mind on a cold, dark Monday morning as I'm overtaken on the work to the station by so many people younger than me, or are they just better at going to the gym? And there's also that desire now for people to work on as long as possible with no compulsory retirement date. But I think there is a question of whether some of us, and I might include myself in this, have a sell-by date that's shorter than others. Um, so, to answer this and other questions, we're really delighted to have with us Ian Deary from the uh, University of Edinburgh. He's currently Professor of um, the gloriously entitled Differential Psychology there, but he's got a background in psychiatry alongside academic psychology, and his research interests concentrate on the things which influence our mental skills, from ageing to illness, so all of those different things. But he's going to talk about a product, project that's called The Disconnected Mind, or around that project, um, which is following up people who took part in the gloriously upfront Scottish mental surveys when they were 11 in 1932 and I think 1947. So this is actually, and all of those, some of those people are being followed up now and they're being tested now to sort of look at um, which factors are related to prolonging healthy brains and fantastic thinking skills in later life. And I hope maybe give us a couple of clues as to how we can make the most of what we've got left. Um, so Ian will talk for about 45 or 50 minutes, and then we'll open up questions um, from you all from the floor. Can you join me in welcoming Ian, and he will um, get going on the secrets of staying sharp in later life. Hello, everyone. Hey, can you hear me all right? Good. That's fine. My name's Ian Deary, and uh, that was the sort of title they wanted me to speak to, but that's the title I'm actually going to speak to. Uh, I thought the other one was a bit too jazzy, actually. So, first, first things first. Uh, Jude and Robin at the British Library, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much in preparing this and, and getting it ready. And second thing is, I'm aware that this is a tricky audience. I know there are what we call lay people in the audience who are not scientists. And I know there are scientists in my area, so it's a really tricky one. So who do you end up talking to? Actually, I thought I'd just talk to my mum. So 
this is being recorded, which means my mum will actually watch it uh, later. So, mum, hello. I, I know that your television is much bigger than this, but this is all they could come up with. And uh, when the people at the back start complaining that they can't see the slides, it's the British Library's fault, not mine. OK, I've made everything as big as I can. So. Preliminary is over. I'm going to talk about healthy cognitive ageing. In fact, I've got a subtitle as well. Ten things worth knowing, I think, about healthy cognitive ageing. There will be a handout at the end. There will not be an examination, uh, but there will be a handout summarising these ten. I debated with myself and Robin and Jude as to whether to give you the handout now, but I find that as soon as you get a handout, your sort of head goes down to the handout. You don't look at me, so why would I do that? So. Uh, this is 10 things worth knowing, I think, about healthy cognitive ageing. So I'm going to actually cheat and do even more than 10 by starting with number zero. And I think this is particularly appropriate because I'm delighted to be speaking at the British Library about a near 20-year research project that started because we found a load of old books. That's not a bad connection with the British Library. So let's do only in Scotland as number one. So Scotland, as you know, is a unique country. But in this regard, at least, it's done something that no country has ever done before or since. On Monday, the 1st of June, 1932, it tested its whole nation's intelligence. It tested everybody born in 1921 at about age 11. 87,498 children took the same mental test on the same day with the same instructions. The Murray House Test number 12, a well-validated test of general intelligence. So Scotland, on that day in 1932, tested the intelligence of everybody born in 1921. So in Scotland, as you walk down, as you know, Socky Hall Street or Princes Street or Aberdeen Union Street, and if you bump into somebody born in 1921, they've almost certainly got an IQ test taken in this survey. And then Scotland did it all again. In 1947, they used exactly the same test again, 15 years later, on Wednesday, June the 4th, 1947, and they tested everybody born in 1936, 70,805 of them, once again using the Murray House Test of General Intelligence. Now, I am going to do a bit of a dance of the seven veils here because there's some things I'm not going to tell you in the talks. So if you want to know why Scotland did this, I'm not going to tell you. You've got to ask that in question time. I'm trying to set it up so that some easy questions in question time and not the difficult ones you guys at the back are going to ask. Okay. Now, I had been researching on the topic of human intelligence for about two decades and I had never heard of these surveys. They were incredibly famous at one time, so famous that the 1932 survey was translated into everything from Swedish to Zulu. But at the same time, I'd never heard of them. And it was kind of a series of accidents between myself and my friend, Professor Lawrence Hawley, that we found them in 1997 at the end of this corridor slide check. Can you actually see this? OK, yeah. So, so at the end of this corridor in Edinburgh, about 15 minutes walk from my office, as it turns out, and there, is what we found were the books, British Library, the books of the Scottish Mental Surveys of 1932 and 1947. And because my talk's a wee bit longer tonight, uh, I'm going to slip in occasional snippets that I don't usually put in. Can you see the 1932 survey there? Well, it's not the entire 1932 survey. The book for Fife is missing, and it's really annoying because we've never found it. And as you know, Pfeiffers like to think of themselves as rather, rather special as well. It was a kingdom at one time, and it's gone missing. It went missing in the 50s, we think, and it's never been found. And those two other piles, the 1947 Scottish Mental Survey. So that's what it looks like when you open it up. At the second column from the right, there is a score out of 76 a score out of 76, and that is the score on the Murray House test number 12. No child got a maximum score, although the occasional older person that we've called back has in fact got a, a maximum score. 
but no child got a maximum score. I've, I've blanked out some of the names, but on that page is, in fact, my Uncle Richard, who took part in that survey, although he died, in fact, in, in 1942 in a submarine in the, in the Mediterranean. That's the 1947 survey, and it was typed. And the extreme right-hand column there has the score out of 76 on the same test. So with regard to these mental surveys, it occurred to Professor Hawley and I almost straight away that here was something incredibly rare. That is, we could measure the change in people's mental ability, their cognitive functions. OK, I'm going to mix it up a wee bit. Sometimes I'm going to say mental ability. Sometimes I'm going to say mental skills. Sometimes I'll say cognitive ability, but it's all the same thing. It's just to try and keep it a wee bit different from time to time. But anyway, here was an opportunity to measure the change in people's mental capability from childhood into older age, if only we could find these people again and follow them up. And so we did. We followed up the Aberdeen birth cohorts of 1921 and 1936, and also the Lothian birth cohorts of 1921 and 1936. And I'm sure most of you know, but I'll say anyway, Lothian is the Edinburgh region, because not everybody in our sample is from Edinburgh City, we call it the Lothian birth cohort because some people come from around Edinburgh. And let me introduce you to some of the Lothian birth cohorts. These are very unusual people who took this mental test at age 11 and are followed up in older age. This is the Lothian birth cohort of 1921. We first saw them at age 79. That's three of them there with another older lady. Uh, actually, just in case you can't see, it's Her Majesty the Queen talking to them uh, around uh, 2000. And on the bottom left there is a photograph of Portobello School, where those three ladies were at school at age 11. And we've seen the Lothian birth court of 1921 at age 79 in the year 2000, then followed them up at 83, 87, 90, 92. Now at 90, I asked my tester to go and see them as near as possible to their 90th birthday. And I said at that point, that's the last time we're ever going to see them. In fact, we're already making plans to see them next year at uh, 95 again. Yep, and they managed to sit for an hour in a brain scanner as well, uh, even having done that. They're a heroic uh, group of individuals. So we've seen them several times, so that's to introduce you to them. And I've got a member of the Lothian birth cohort of 1936 to show you. That's Bill. Now, I should say these individuals give permission for the photographs to be shown. They, they're quite happy with that. And that's Bill, who's a member of the 1091 strong Lothian birth cohort of 1936 also known as the Age UK Disconnected Mind Project. And that was him almost at age 11 in 1947 when he first took the Scottish Mental Survey Murray House test. And we've seen those individuals at age 70, around 2006, at age 73, age 76. And they're currently in the field and just halfway through seeing them at age 79. I've been in London all day, but my team better have been seeing some of them today uh, back, in, back in Edinburgh. So they're, they're, they're in the field just now. So what I thought I'd do next is say, having, and again, this is something I have to miss out because of time. If you want to know how we actually find these individuals after all that time, because we're not allowed to write to them having got their information from those books, uh, you can ask that later. That's one of the reunions. Uh, of the 1921 and 1936 together. Anybody recognise the hall in Edinburgh? It's, it's the Assembly Hall of the Church of Scotland. It's one of the few places that's big enough to, to hold them all when they're en masse. Uh, and I want to just tell you the sorts of things we do with them. Isn't that nice, that spinning thing? So from left to right at the top, I've put the things that cost us a lot of money. So on the left, that's an array of genetic testing. And just to let those of you, especially the, the, the non-scientists know, we do over half a million genetic tests on every single person. So we do over half a million genetic tests on every single person. In the middle, that's a brain scan. So they take a brain scan, a structural magnetic resonance brain scan that lasts about 70, 75 minutes. And on the right-hand side, wait for it, they do 16 different cognitive tests. Of course, they get breaks and things. Don't worry, we don't abuse them. But they get 16 cognitive tests. So they do a good assault course of different types of mental functioning. And along the bottom, I've put an array of things. But let me just tell you, we do sensory function like vision and hearing. We test their health. We measure bits of their body. 
We take pictures of the backs of their eyes because that's the only place in the body where you can see the brain's blood supply. So we want to look at the characteristics of that. We take 13 bottles of blood from them. Tony Hancock fans, that's very nearly an armful. Uh, OK, good few of you, I suppose. It's an old reference. And on the right-hand side, they get a large wadge of questionnaires sent to them before they come in to see us in the first place as well. So effectively, they spend three days helping us every three years. A big wadge of questionnaires at home. They come in for medical and cognitive testing. Then a separate day, they come in for a brain scan. And if you look at me for a moment, they also get an ultrasound scan of the carotid arteries in the neck as well to see how flare, uh, furred up they are. OK, that's some of the things that we do with them. I can't tell you everything. It take too long. Right, so finally, you get on to the first of the 10 things I want to tell you about human cognitive aging. Yeah, I know some of you are looking at your watch already. God, surely we're nearly getting home. Right. So the first thing is that, have you realized now we've got these two very unusual cohorts because they're pretty much all the same age? We've got people born in 1921, we've got people born in 1936. So the fascinating thing is about them is chronologically, they're about the same age, but biologically and cognitively, they look rather different, as you'll see. So number one is people of the same age differ. So, what we're trying to answer in this research project is why do some people's brains and thinking skills age better than others? Right, I'm going to show you a video now. And I want to tell you before I show you it, it says there the human brain from 25 to 90 in 21 seconds. I'm going to show you how your brain is going to age from age 25 to age 90. Before I do, I'm going to do some credits here. This is the work of my neuroimaging leads on the project, especially Professor Joanna Wardlaw and some of her team. And what they've done is they've taken average brain scans of different aged people, thousands of them, and put them all together in the same space to show you how the brain ages. Now look at me again. The brain is cut this way. So it's like odd job has thrown his bowler hat and chopped your head straight off. Yeah, okay, that was a bit better than Tony Hancock. Right. So <laughs> Have a look at how the brain is aging from 25 to 90 in 21 seconds. If my hand's too sweaty, it's not going to work. Here we go. So it's nice and full. And if you look at those black bits in the middle, those are the water spaces of the brain. They're going to get bigger, 40s to 50s, 50s to 60s, early to mid 70s mid to late 70s, 90s. Yep, I hear you. <laughs> the great thing is, the 70s to 90s were all Lothian birth cohort brain samples in that video. So, do you want to see it again? If you said no, you've had it. Right, so that's the 25, 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, 40s to 50s, 50s into 60s. Nothing much happens really until you get to about my age. In fact, early to mid 70s, mid to late 70s, and the 90s. So none of these people have got dementia. I should have said that. These are healthy, cognitive, and brain aging. Right. So, right. But what did I say? People of the same age differ. And you should be bringing me up on this already because I've told you a lie. What I've shown you is the average, but we're not. People of the same age differ. Now, in our team, we got some of our postdoctoral scientists to pull out of the 700 odd brain scans we've got in the Lothian birth cohort 1936, 12 brain scans to show you the range of the brain in people of the same age. So look at me again. This is cut this way, straight down the way this time. And can you see that? Well, you should be saying no, you can't see that. You want to see it in more detail. So I'll show you it in more detail. The top left brain is somebody of 73, and I'd be reasonably happy with that brain, I have to say, structurally. I'm not anywhere near 73, just in case you were thinking I was satisfied because it was the same age as me. And the bottom right brain, I wouldn't be so happy with. In fact, as a 73-year-old, I wouldn't be happy. So it's those two of the more extreme ones. And let me just give you them 
Can you see the difference? Don't worry about the fact that one's wider than the other. It's how full it is. Can you see more black space, basically, on the, on the right-hand one? So that's the first thing. Some people's brains shrink more than others. We want to find out why that is. So those are from the Lothian Birth Court, 1936, at about age 73. And I want to show you something else. Right, what do you see in that? That's 12 more brains from the 700-odd that we scanned. What do you see? White blobs. Okay, and it's cut, thanks. It's cut this way this time. Back to odd job, okay? So can you see that the top left one is all pretty much grey and the bottom right one has got a lot of white blobs, okay? So let's go again, let's just emphasise that. And there they are, two extremes. People of the same age. And one has got more white matter hyper intensities than the other. Now, like most scientific things, it's a simple phrase just to, just to bamboozle you. So white matter, the connections in the brain, the white matter I'll be talking about later, hyper intensities, they look intense on a brain scan. And those are basically scars in the connections of people's brains. They're not an illness, but can you see that some people collect more of these scars than others? And I'll be telling you later how they relate to our thinking skills. No, that's not good. Right. Right, that's number one. People of the same age differ, and I've shown you some brain differences. Now, the second thing is, and I'm not going to use Lothian birth cohort data for this because I could show you lots of different things. The second thing is, with regard to mental skills, cognitive functions, there is some good news. It does not all go when it goes, okay? And I want to show you some evidence of that. So there are lots of different mental skills, and I've put some of them here. Language, vocabulary, working memory, executive function, attention, spatial ability, processing speed. But you all recognize this, that we haven't just got one mental capability. We've got different types. And they don't all age at the same rate. Now, you don't need to see this in detail, but it's got two words on it. Episodic memory. What does that mean? What did you have for breakfast yesterday morning? That's an episodic memory. A memory in time and a memory of a particular fact. It doesn't age brilliantly, but can you see on the left-hand side is age 20, on the right-hand side is age 80, and broadly speaking, would you all agree with me, it kind of goes down a bit from 20 to 50, but then things start to slide a bit faster, yes? Okay, so that's on average, and that's three different tests of episodic memory going down, okay? And these are from the Virginia Longitudinal Study. Those are cross-sectional data for the, for the scientists. And these also are cross-sectional data measuring people of different ages. And this is reasoning. And what they mean by reasoning in this is being given a certain number of instances and being asked to work out how those instances make a logical flow and then complete. So, for example, if I said two, four, six, and you would be able to say eight, because rather smartly you've worked out what the logical series is and been able to add one on to the end of it. Of course, most are harder than that, but that's just an example. And again, with reasoning, can you all see that from 20 to about 50, 60, it goes down a bit, but things go down a bit after that. Okay, so I'm going to give you the darkness before the dawn here. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to show you is speed of thinking, what we call processing speed. And there is no hiding place on this one, because I think you've got your eye in by now. And here are several different tests of processing speed, and that's what happens. Okay. Now, let me just look around the audience. We're all past our peak <laughs> on this one. Now, when I, um, when I went to the conference today, there are lots of young people who haven't actually come along to this, but they would probably be at their peak today, which is why we find them stimulating company, anyway, for perceptual speed. So let me just move on quickly and show you something that's rather different. Vocabulary. Yeah, I can hear you. I hear you. Relief. <laughs> So on average, vocabulary, general knowledge, and some number skills are sort of peaking at middle to early older age as well. Okay, yeah, thumbs up to, from me as well. That's one thing we've got going for us, okay? Yeah, okay, so vocabulary is not so bad. And this is an interesting one, actually. Let me just describe what this is. All you need to be able to see is, first of all, there are 30, three zero, of the world's most famous and widely used cognitive mental tests listed from top to bottom. There are also, on the right-hand side, some white blocks that indicate when the peak performance of each of these 30 tests is. 
And I've put, just for your delectation, age 30 with a big red stripe, and anything to the left of age 30 peaks before 30, and any of these 30 tests to the right peak after age 30. And it's the same again. It's sort of the few vocabulary, general knowledge, number of skills that peak after 30, and there's rather a rush of one that peak before 30 as well. Right, oh God. So I said I was cheating by having a number zero in my 10. I've also got a 2B. Yeah. Life's like that. So it doesn't all go when it goes. Is that all right if I sort of delivered on that? But what does go does matter to some extent. Now, I think it would be fair of you to be saying, what you're largely talking about, that's me, what you're largely talking about is some rather abstruse mental test that you use in the laboratory. But of course, you're all out in the real world doing real things and it might not apply. Well, let's just see. So this is one from, from my friend Elliot Tucker Drob in Texas. He published this fairly recently. And he took a large group of older people. And on the left-hand side, is it left to you? Yes, the left-hand side. He looked at change in speed of thinking over time in older age. He looked at change in memory. He looked at change in reasoning. And what he found was that people who were declining on one of these were also tending to decline on the others. So let me just repeat that. People who were declining in speed also tended to be declining in reasoning and memory. Then he said, let's take some practical activities. So he took timed practical activities, observed activities, watching people do practical things in real life settings, and everyday problem solving. That was, for example, like giving change from a certain amount. And what he found too was that people who were declining or staying better on each of these tended to be declining as well on the others. So what on the one hand, on the left he was saying was, people who tend to decline on one type of mental test are also declining on the others. Or people who are declining on one set of practical skills also tend to be declining on the others. But the punchline is about to come. What I want to ask you is, how strongly is change in these laboratory cognitive tests, in these older people, related to changes in practical skills? Now, I'm going to put a number up, and you've got to guess what it is. If there's no relationship at all, it's zero. If there's a perfect association, very unlikely, it's one. You want to make a guess? Well, I was hoping for something a bit smaller so I could surprise them, but uh, okay, not bad. <laughs> it's pretty big, 0.91. So there's a strong tendency for those people who are declining on the laboratory tests over time in older age also to be declining on practical skills. So when it goes, it does matter to some extent as well. Number three, as I said earlier, showing you the average changes in cognitive skills is a lie because we don't all follow the crowd. Not only are, do people of the same age differ, they differ in how they change over time as well. So I want to show you how we don't all follow the crowd. That's Miss Lawson, one of the Lothian birth cohort of 1936. And that's her holding a photograph just around the time that she took the original test. And we've been studying what we call lifetime, I know it's not quite lifetime, but lifetime cognitive aging from age 11 to age 70. And again, for those of you who are into the statistic, this is a scattergram. It's the Murray House test at age 11 on the x-axis along the bottom. And it's the same test taken 60 years later at age 70, the same test, the same instructions, taken 60 years later by over 1,000 of the Lothian birth cohort 1936, and the correlation is about 0.7. So, and I can see that you're squaring that in your head already and thinking that's quite interesting because that's 50% of the variance is stable between childhood and older age. But what I find is that nobody who hasn't taken statistics ever understands this graph, even though it's the most amazing thing. You can plot 1,000 people's test scores at age 11 and then at age 70 on exactly the same test. So what I'm going to show you is why I have said that we don't all follow the crowd. Is it all right if I set everybody at age 11 just to their own baseline, never mind whether some bright spark scored better than others? What I'm going to show you next is exactly the same data as these, but shown in a different, I hope, more accessible way. Let me try it. These are exactly the same data. On the left, 
I have just taken everybody's score at age 11 and said, that's their baseline. So let's say old Robert here at the front has done a lot better than me. I'm not bothering about that. I'm just putting us at the same bit and asking, has he gone up or staying the same or gone down? And have I gone up, staying the same or gone down? Does that make sense to you? Well, there's enough nodes, I think I'll move on. All right. So basically, from 11 to 70, some people up at the top, what I'm calling healthy cognitive aging, some people are actually scoring better than you would have expected given their score at age 11. That's really important. I'm going to build on that. And down at the bottom, without getting dementia, some people are scoring on this test less well than I would expect or we would expect given their score at age 11. And like most things, most people perform about average. And so most people are kind of performing about what you would expect. Is that all right? Do, do you see what's going on there? So what we're trying to find out is this. Basically, I could just have given you this and sent you home and said, we're trying to find out why some people are going up in this brush and some people are going down in this brunch, brush. I want to know the secrets of the folk at the top and what to avoid, including choosing parents wisely, uh, according to the people at the bottom. <laughs> right, is that all right? That's really kind of important. Uh, that's in your handout, okay, right. So, but because we've been following people up, bothering them from 70, 73, 76, we've also got data on all these mental tests across the 70s. So, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Let's do it again. That's Miss Lawson. Oh, this is gonna be hellish time wise. Okay, right. Uh, that's Miss Lawson again at 70, 73 and 76. And as a study director, you've got to make decisions all the time because these, are, these studies are getting longer and longer. They used to come in with us for about three and a half to four hours. Now they're coming in for five and a half to six hours. Anyway, don't, we, we can delete that later. Right. Uh, however, I did make a decision that we probably didn't need these photographs at 79. Can you believe it? Actually, of course, it turns out it is actually rather useful and wonderful to, to, to have them. Anyway, we'll start again. But we've got 70, 73, and 76. So I've put together the 16 cognitive tests that the Lothian birth cohort took at 70, 73, and 76. And I'm showing you the average. Can you see there's a bit of a decline across the 70s? Right. And can you also think to yourself, why has he left such a lot of white space? That's the average decline because I asked Dr. Ritchie, one of my postdoctoral scientists, to pull out 10 people at random from the Lothian birth cohort 1936, just to show you that we don't all follow the crowd. See what I mean? That's what we're trying to find out. Not that boring line, but why people are differing so much in their trajectories, as we call them, other pathways. Okay, see, it starts to move a bit faster now. Okay, so what you're all thinking is, with regard to that brush, that blue brush I showed you, how do some people end up doing a bit better in older age than you would expect, and some people end up doing a bit worse than you would expect? So we're trying to find out this basically. Is it fate or is it providence? Is it basically what you're given, or is it how well you look after yourself? And I know some of it will turn out to be chance or stochastic uh, effects. That's just a fancy word for chance. Okay, so that's all we're trying to find out. How do you get good cognitive ability in older age? And as Fred Astaire said, old age is like everything else. To make a success of it, you've got to start young. And I've already shown you that that is the case because, and again, can you just listen to this for a second, 50% of older people's differences in thinking skill were already there at 11. Okay, so we're trying, but forget about that. I'm not interested in stability. It's the change, it's only 50%. So something can be changed over that time. So simply we ask, what else? So apart from one's cognitive skills at age 11, and of course we have to ask the question, how did they get their cognitive skills at age 11? But that's not for tonight. We're going to ask, what else, in addition to starting well at age 11, is getting them into older age with good cognitive skills? Now, I'm going to get it out of the way first, because I'm going to deal with genetics. So this is Bill again. And what I'm trying to show you here is that we had the opportunity to do something very unusual. We had what's called genome-wide genetic testing. There's over half a million tests on everybody. And we had the change in cognitive function from childhood into older age. And we said, to what extent, this is quite a long sentence, so hang on, to what extent 
do people's differences in how much they change between childhood and older age are due to genetic factors? How much are the differences in people's changes from childhood to older age down to genetic factors? And the answer is about a quarter. And we published it in this journal here, which is not shabby. And basically the answer was about a quarter of people's differences in how much they change from childhood to older age are about a quarter. So shall we go on the hunt for the other three quarters? That's surely a bit more interesting than that. Right, so with regard to cognition in older age, start off with good cognition at age 11, but what else? So these are some of the things, we already talked about genetics, and these are some of the other things that we've looked at. And just in case people can't see them, I'm going down genetics, caffeine, alcohol, other dietary intakes, body mass index, cholesterol, being socially, intellectually engaged, not smoking, being physically active, physically fit, having a, an engaging occupation, being more educated, being bilingual, having a well-connected brain and a low allostatic load. Anybody put your hand up if you don't know what a low allostatic load is? Ask me later. Okay, hands down. <laughs> uh, right. I'm gonna, I've got a whole section on that, thanks. I'm quite happy with these sorts of hecklings as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> If, 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 there's a nasty, if there's a nasty one, I've got a Harry Hill one just in case as well. So, right. So, number five. Is it true that mens sana incorpore sano? Yeah, that's for those of us who went to grammar school. So, and uh, for those who went, not like me, to private school, we probably also know that it was by Juvenal in his satires number 10. Anyway, is there a healthy mind in a healthy body? And these are some of the sorts of things we do to look at that. And so that's Heather uh, testing one of the Lothian birth cohort 1936 for a standard walk time. And at the top right, that's something called a dynamometer. Somebody actually invented a machine to find how good you can grasp. It's called a dynamometer. And probably quite a lot of you like me have blown out of a spirometer to find out how good the lungs are. So wait for this. People who are good uh, one of these physical capabilities tend to be good at the others as well in, in, in older age. So there's a kind of a general fitness. And that's one of the things that contributes to being thinking better. And just to show you, this is just to remind me really, at the top there, what I'm telling you is this, is that, again, wait for it, we found, and this was in the Lothian birth court of 1921, people who were physically fitter on those tests tended to be scoring better on cognitive functions in older age than we would have expected given their test at age 11. Is that clear? So they've got a sort of a bit of a boost by being physically fitter. And then at the bottom, in the Lothian birth court 1936, we actually had some harder evidence than that. And I know cognitive tests aren't soft, but we found that people who are physically fitter had less shrunk brains and better connected brains as well. So it was even harder data that being physically fit was a, good, was a good thing. Oh, that's another thing, by the way. This whole association between physical fitness and health and cognitive ability is really interesting. And there's a thing that used to be called terminal drop, and people thought that was a bit rude, so they changed it to terminal decline. And terminal decline is really interesting and is available as a question in question time. Terminal decline. Right, so number six. I remember being at a talk in Edinburgh, and uh, some Edinburghians are a bit grumpy at times, and I got this civil engineer, it was a talk like this, and he said afterwards, none of what you're saying is any use unless you can explain 90 to 100% of the variance. Now, I'm hoping social scientists will shrink in horror at that sort of thing, but basically you don't want bridges falling down, and that's probably fair enough. However, it did make me realise that one should be absolutely clear about the effect sizes that we're discovering here. And so this is the sort of phrase we're pushing now, just to be clear. It's marginal gains, not magic bullets, with regard to cognitive ageing as well. And I got this phrase from Sir David Brailsford, and what he said was that with regard to the Sky Cycling team, who he transformed, uh, Songs Doping, I think, is that all right to say? Yeah, that Songs Doping, and actually got them to win things. He said, we've got this saying, performance by the aggregation of marginal gains. It means taking the 1% from everything you do, finding a 1% margin for improvement in everything that you do. So let me just explain what he did. He took really silly little things, like saying that most high-end bicycles had almost perfectly circular wheels. He said, 
but let's get them even more circular than that. And these tiny little changes. So when it comes to cognitive aging, some of the things I'm going to describe are not going to have massive benefits to an individual. But if you pay attention to each of these individual things, you're playing the numbers to help yourself get on the right side of providence. Is, is that all right? So I'm not going to exaggerate these things, but they're probably good things to do. And I'll say for other reasons as well, but marginal gains. So with regard to good cognition at age 11, what else provides good cognition at age 11? So starting position at age 11 has a big effect. As I said earlier, about 50% of the variance. With regard to other things like genes and education and smoking and fitness, we're often talking about 1%, adding a further 1% of explanation. So I want to just give you that difference. We're looking for these relatively small effects. Is that clear, clear enough? Right. Number seven. Replication, replication, replication. See what I did there? Yep, okay. So, don't trust any one study. Even the Lothian birth cohort studies should not be trusted. Because I'm reading and my team are coming in and including my parents tell me that they read almost every other day in the newspapers that there is some magical formula or thing that you can do to help cognitive aging. However, again, for those of you who especially are not scientists, there is a thing out there called systematic reviews and meta-analysis. This means putting the best evidence from as many studies as you can find to find out overall whether there's an effect or not. As what I'm gonna do in number seven is rather boringly take you through some of these overviews. So do you see what I'm saying? Don't trust any one study. Try and find out what's the overall science saying. And you can find that out by these things called systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So for example, uh, Brenda Plastman in the States had a systematic review of factors associated with risk for and possible prevention of cognitive decline in later life, which we all want to know about. So this is what she said. This is my scribbling, by the way, just to take out the bits I didn't want. On the basis of observational studies, so for example, our studies are observational, evidence that supported the benefits of selected nutritional factors, or cognitive, physical, or other leisure activities was limited. Now, just to be clear, I might have built your hopes up there just to knock them down. She is saying there is very limited evidence that nutritional factors are being physically or socially and intellectually engaged are actually helpful. However, she found better evidence for tobacco, not using tobacco, in other words, not smoking seemed to be a good thing for brain aging, and also I'll skip that one, and also avoiding certain medical conditions. Right, who's never heard of the apolipoprotein E allele? Okay, right, that's all right, I'll speak to you. So, on chromosome 19, you've all got 22 plus some sexy ones at the end, but on chromosome 19, there is a gene called apolipoprotein E, and a quarter of us, in this room, I've never had mine tested, a quarter of us in this room have got a version that makes us slightly more likely to older age dementia and cognitive decline. And she is saying there is some good evidence that that's the case. And we certainly found that in our Lothian cohorts as well. That's one of these examples where you should choose your parents fairly, fairly wisely. Okay, so let's just run through another couple. Epidemiologic studies of modifiable factors associated with cognition and dementia, systematic review, as I said, and meta-analysis came out last year. So what are they saying? Oh, again, that's quite nice. I'll do it again. The estimated population attributable percentage rates were particularly high for physical activity and smoking. That's 258 studies, all of whom had over 300 people in them. So that overview was saying there's pretty good evidence that being physically fit is good for thinking skills and so is not smoking. Right, and I've said here, there are three things that people always ask me about when I give lay talks. Will these help my brain or thinking skills to age well? First, physical activity. Second, cognitive activity, especially something called Sudoku. Okay, some of you seem to like it. And and diet, especially the Mediterranean diet. So a wee bit on each of those. So there was a review of physical activity and cognitive function in individuals over 60 years of age, a systematic review. And what did it say? It said, 
Despite caveats, the current evidence suggests that physical activity may help to improve cognitive function and consequently delay progression of cognitive impairment in the elderly. So yet again, physical function. This was the list of studies from top to bottom of computerized cognitive training. Now, I've already told you these things are kind of buying you very small amounts of benefit, maybe sort of in a big group, about 1% of the variance. There's no way you're going to get me in a computerized cognitive training thing. I'll go and watch a Shakespeare play or listen to a, a symphony or something, but I'm not going to do long division for three hours at a time. But anyway, the evidence seemed to be that computerized cognitive training is modestly effective at improving cognitive performance in healthy older adults, but efficacy varies across cognitive domains. So it's differently effective for different types of thinking skill. Unsupervised at-home training and training more than three times a week are specifically ineffective. Now, I can see why at home you might be larking about, but why doing more than three times a week was ineffective, I've still to, to, to work out. Oh, and there is a 10-year follow-up study of some of this stuff you can ask me about later. And this is my last one. It's one where they, they had a, a review of this, cognitive health and the Mediterranean diet. Is it the diet specifically, or is it to do with a whole lifestyle to do with the diet? Answer, we don't know. So that'll save you reading that. Okay. Number eight, we're nearly there. And I've left this deliberately to number eight because this is the hardest to grasp of all my 10 points. And it's called confounding or reverse causation. And again, it's something that's rather special that we can use the Lothian birth cohorts to ask questions about. It's also known, for those of you in the business, as differential preservation versus the preservation of differences. But let me just do a couple of diagrams with you. You've seen this before. Good cognition in older age. We're trying to understand why some people have got strong cognitive skills in older age. And we already said endlessly that starting off with good cognition at age 11 is one thing, but we want to find out these factor Xs. So the factor Xs might be not smoking or physical activity, but Please look at that diagram because it might just look like a little set of boxes and arrows, but it makes a very specific hypothesis. It says that that factor X, which might be drinking rhubarb juice or something like that, is contributing to cognitive function in older age over and above cognitive function in youth. You got that? This is really key, okay? However, there's another possibility, and it's this. Couldn't it just be that bright sparks at age 11 end up being smarter in older age and also doing lots of this good stuff. But in fact, this good stuff isn't helping their cognitive function. Now, unless you've really got that, that's not good. Oh, right, just to go on. So green is used deliberately here. So green is good stuff. Green is the factor Xs that add predictive variance to cognitive function in older age over and above cognitive function in youth. But there's also this reverse possibility that in fact the stuff we're measuring, so let me take an example. In fact, I can take a real example. Right, let's take socio-intellectual activities. This is the Lothian birth cohort, 1936, okay? And we measured 16. We asked them about 16 different social and intellectual activities and have represented them here by a series of Google images. So, for example, you can see there's night classes, reading the newspaper. Bottom left is actually going to sports events. I've put my team Motherwell in there. It uh, doesn't seem very intellectual, I have to say, going to see them, but there you go. And we did some statistics. And we found that people who were more engaged in one set of social intellectual activities also tended to do more of all the others except for one. There's one activity there that doesn't seem to be an intellectual social activity at all. Watching telly. I'll just do that again. So that drops out. <laughs> so this is what we thought. This was the hypothesis tested by Dr. Gow and my team, that in addition to having good cognition at age 11, engaging in lots of social intellectual activities was giving you a little boost to your cognitive functions in older age. But this is what he found when he analyzed his statistics. He found that bright sparks at age 11 tended to be brighter in older age and to be the people doing all this stuff. But this stuff wasn't placing them any better than we'd expected all along. Have you got that okay? Right, that's reverse causation or confounding. 
Okay, and it's very unusual to have this age 11 ability to, to be able to test this possibility. So everybody asks about diet. So let's give you the Lothian Birth Court, 1936. There are six scientific papers, mostly done by Janie Corley in my group in this list. But here we're asking this question. Does eating the Mediterranean diet, avoiding the traditional Scottish diet, let's not even go there, <laughs> taking more antioxidants, drinking more alcohol, taking more posh coffee, taking in flavonoids, tea and apples and things, and having a low body mass index, are they all associated with good cognitive function in older age? Answer, yes. In every single case, the answer is that people who took more of the Mediterranean diet, less of the traditional diet, more antioxidants, drank moderately on alcohol, the Lothian cohort are not big drinkers, took more coffee as opposed to tea, more flavonoids, and had a lower body mass index, had better cognitive functions. However, the story's not finished. These diet things were measured at age 70. We then asked the question, are these diet things related to a 45-minute mental test they took 60 years previously? Answer, yes, in exactly the same direction. So then we asked, how many of these associations with diet in older age survive controlling for this age 11 IQ 60 years before? And here you go. Here are the dietary factors that contribute to cognitive function in older age, in addition to being bright at age 11. None. Let me just be clear. What we're finding there is that eating, let's just call it a good diet, but you know what I mean, in older age seems to be a lifestyle outcome of probably being brighter in youth, having got more education, having a more engaged prof professional job and engaging in a series of lifestyle things like eating this type of diet and probably reading broadsheet newspapers and listening to the archers. Okay, you get the idea. It's probably more a series of lifestyle outcomes. So on the right-hand side are the green ones, the ones that in our study at least, and remember it's not replicated, but that's in our study, seem to be contributing to better cognitive function in older age in addition to cognitive function in youth. And on the left are the red ones, the ones that seem to be confounding or reverse causation. Now let's just repeat, the ones in red are associated with cognitive function in older age, but not in addition to how bright people were in childhood. So the answer is that bright children seem to drink posher coffee when they get older, a bit more alcohol, they tend to take the Mediterranean diet, have a lower body mass index, have lower cholesterol and are more engaged. Now I remember when it came to alcohol, I opened this one up by saying in Glasgow uh, that drinking a bit more alcohol was good for cognitive function in older age and there was actually a cheer of 300 people. <laughs> And then I had to say, but it's explained by cognitive function 60 years ago, and it just simply reflects the fact that we're finding that people who are bright in childhood tend to be the sort of person who take a few glasses of red wine later in life. Right, I'm going to uh, talk now about the brain in my second last one as well. And before I get to that, remember I said earlier that some of these lifestyle things like physical fitness don't just help cognitive function, they also help the brain. Well, similarly, not smoking. This is something we published this year with some Canadian folks. This is the Lothian birth cohort of 1936. Now, can you see these brain pictures? Can you just see that there's some yellow on them? Right. Okay. So the bits with yellow are bits where people who smoke have got thinner grey matter. So look at me. Grey matter is on the surface of the brain. It's the brain's nerve cells, and it's thinner in people who smoke. And we reckon that if you stop smoking, it takes about 15 to 25 years to catch up or for those effects to, to go away. So again, second last section, the disconnected mind. I'm going to look at the brain. So in the Lothian birth cohort, very unusual, all about the same age, over 700 of the thousand odd got a brain scan that lasted about 70 minutes. And it gives us lots of different types of information, which is just all amusing. This is a placeholder to show you. But I thought that might be a bit too abstruse. And so this gentleman is a member of the Lothian Birth Cohort 1936, and he's given us permission to show you how his data, his brain imaging data, exists inside his head. And there they are. So those are his own brain imaging data inside his head. And what I want to tell you is, what is it about the brain 
that contributes to better thinking skills in older age. Now, think about it. We do a brain scan, we're gonna measure some stuff. So what is it about these brain scans? So first of all, this is what the data actually look like. So I'm taking it away from his face because that's too distracting. Those are his data. That's the first thing. Again, we've reconstructed his brain inside his brain scan image. And so the first thing I'm telling you is that people who have got better thinking skills in older age have got bigger brains, less shrunk than they were. So first of all, they've got more brain inside the skull. And secondly, can you see there, we can get our research scientists to draw around the inside of the skull. I'm gonna take a moment to tell you about this. It's amazing. The skull's really hard. It doesn't change from when it settles down in adolescence. And so when you do a brain scan, you can get two measures. First of all, how much brain have you still got inside your head? And how much brain did you used to have? You get the idea? Because although it's shrinking, you can't get away from the fact that your, your inside of your head used to be this size. Now, both of those things contribute to your cognitive skills in older age. How big your brain used to be and how much it has shrunk. Both of those contribute. So we published that estimated maximal and current brain volume predict cognitive ability in older age. And for those of you at the back, we did this with a structural equation model with regard to cognitive functions and brain. And we found that both intracranial volume, how big your brain used to be, how much gray matter and how much white matter you've still got contribute to your thinking skills. But we also found something quite interesting was that mental ability at age 11 were associated how good the brain looked in older age as well, probably because they've always tracked. Do you all know about the scientific process whereby you've got to send your results into a journal and you get your peers reviewing it and picking holes in it all over the place? We really do get people saying, it's a pity you didn't have brain scans at 1947. They didn't even invent magnetic imaging at that time. Okay, so you get the idea. Right. So I've told you how big your brain is and how big your brain used to be both contribute, all right? Then, not a big surprise, but as the brain ages, as it does in the Lothian birth court 1936, as the brain ages over the 70s, that parallels changes in thinking skills. So just to repeat that. So as the brain shrinks, as we measure them from time to time to time, that parallels the changes in thinking skills. And again, we've done that using structural equation modeling. Right. Part 9b is the really disconnected mind. So again, just look at me for a moment. I talked about the gray matter, and the gray matter helps you think because you've got brain connections. You've got about 100 billion nerve cells, and they're all connected with 100 trillion connections. And we can look at these inside the brain. And this is the map of central Scotland. And your brain's a bit like the map of central Scotland because with regard to these connections called the white matter of the brain, they're running all over the brain, a bit like motorways and A roads and B roads. And some of us, as we get older, get potholes in our roads and we get road closures and we get cones all over the place. You get the idea. Some of us, our connections age better than others. And so... Here's another diagram. This again is that chap. You remember the chap earlier I showed you? These are his data. And these are his connections in the brain. And this is rather beautiful. So although the colors are false, these are the connections inside a human brain. And we can measure how good these are, how intact they are, how healthy they are, and relate them to thinking skills. And we put them inside that chap's head as well. So these are his data inside his own head. And then we liked them so much, we reconstructed a metal model of them as well. So here are his connections. And so watch his connections in his brain that we can measure for how healthy they are. So these are representations of his trillions of connections. Isn't that beautiful? And of course, I've not built it up this far to tell you that that's not related to how good your thinking skill is. So, I think we've got a boring slide now. Oh no, yes, yeah, okay. We measure the health of some of the main A roads and basically motorways inside the brain. And we find that about 10% 
of how good people's thinking skills are in older age are down to how healthy their connections are. And also, how many scars, do you remember right at the beginning I showed the little white blobs in the brain, how many of these scars you collect are related to your thinking skills? And, and as you age from 70 to 80, the more your white matter deteriorates, your connections deteriorate, your white matter deteriorates, the less good your thinking skills are becoming as well. And that's a structural equation model. I'm, okay, okay, I'm not talking to you at the front. This is for the folk at the back, okay, who are going to be a bit grumpy how this was done. That was a structural equation model we did for that one. And that's him again. And we liked his brain so much that we printed it. And this is his brain. So you can have a look. That's a 3D, the first 3D printing we ever did. We printed uh, his brain. It's really nice. I'd, again, I'd be quite pleased with that, actually. Probably produce a few more papers every year. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome to come and have looked at it. Right, last. So, I have to confess something here. I've maybe put too much emphasis on thinking in the raw. That is, remember all that stuff that declines as you get older? Yeah, they're done, those estimates of mental function are done by mental tests, and you've all done mental tests of a type, and you'll realize that what they do is they make you think as hard as you can. But how often are we really doing that? How often are we really racing with regard to mental function? I always say this, even as an academic, I don't have to think very hard most of the time. And so sometimes we're just cruising and sometimes we're racing. And so with regard to aging, what stays relatively good is knowledge. And what tends to go down a bit is working out new stuff, as I showed you earlier. So I just want to emphasize that we're not always racing, as we tend to do when we're measuring people's cognitive functions, asking them to do as well as they can. Sometimes we're cruising. And I've got a little slide, and this is not an easy one to explain, but it's quite funny. And I was delighted when I gave a talk fairly recently. Somebody started laughing halfway through my explanation of it because she'd actually got it. But what this shows is age 20 to 70 along the bottom, and the proportion of the US population up the left-hand side. And what I want you to look at, first of all, is the black circles. It just shows the proportion of the population of different ages, okay? Slightly more young people than old. Now, can you look at the upside down open triangles? And there's a peak at about age 25 to 30. Can you see that? That's where the best 25% of reasoners are. So the people that are really good at reasoning are concentrated on the left-hand side. See that big hump at the right-hand side? That's where the Fortune 500 chief executive officers are, <laughs> amongst the people who have forgotten how to reason. So it is quite funny. And that was done by Tim Salthouse, just to make the point that we value things other than raw thinking power in older age. Right, oh God, there's a number 11 as well, just to keep you in your seat. Right, there's more to life than thinking. This is the person who was the last tested person at age 90 from the Lothian birth cohort, 1921. And we asked them all, how satisfied are you with your life? And can you see that most people agreed or strongly agreed that they were still highly satisfied with their life? And I'm absolutely delighted to say that life satisfaction had zero no association with childhood intelligence at all. Had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So I'm going to finish with a couple of, because I'm in the British Library, a couple of authors rather than scientists. I like this one too. So the question becomes in older age, we're sagacious. So we've got sagacity, we've got wisdom, if not raw thinking. Have we also got serenity? Well, George Gissing, my favourite author of all time, said, I cannot preserve more than a few fragments of what I read Yet read I shall, persistingly, rejoicingly. Indeed, it no longer troubles me that I forget. I have the happiness of the passing moment, and what more can mortal ask? That's not bad, is it? He was 42 when he wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I could go on. There's more to life than thinking. Genetics are not destiny. The environment can be partly genetic. There's the Flynn effect. Factors that might protect cognitive health are often good for general health and good fun. And lastly, beware buzzwords and phrases. In my area, there are buzzwords like reserve, resilience, system integrity, common cause and allostasis, because 
There are all these buzzwords because the scientists are trying to find a way to summarize what do we actually, how do we want to describe the person who has aged well? And I'm going to use a Scottish poet for my very last content slide before I have a few slides of thank you. This is Alistair Reid, and this is a short version of his poem, Weathering, that I butchered a bit. From wearing a face all this time, I am made aware of the maps that faces are, of the inside wear and tear I take to faces that have come far. It is an equilibrium that breasts the cresting seasons, but still stays calm and keeps warm. It deserves a good name. Weathering. Weathering is what I would like to do well. So if you want to know more about the Lothian Birth Court 1936, the journal Science did a four-page feature on Halloween 2014. If you can't get it, I will send you. I answer emails. Thank you to the Lothian Birth Cohorts, to my team. Obviously, I'm just speaking on behalf of all of them because they've done all the work and they just send me down to London to talk about it. And to the Lothian Birth Court collaborators. And to a special thanks to my funders, Age UK, Medical Research Council, BBSRC and Age Scotland. That's it. Thank you very much. We have time just for a few questions, and I've got the list of the ones that Ian said we could ask if nobody else has got any questions, but I'm sure there are questions here. There's one there. Do you want to take a couple at a time? Do you want any more straight away? One over there. So, do you want to go first? You can go first. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, when you talk about physical activity, yep. what are we talking about? Is it the more you do, the better, or is it the sort of, you know, 30 minutes of moderate exercise three times a week? Yeah, we're asking two different things. One is the physical fitness is measured according to the ways I showed in the pictures, so various physical fitness. And with regard to physical fitness, we ask people about how active they are during the week. So it's whether they're engaging in moderate or even heavy duties more than, more than once during the week. So, and again, studies have measured it in different ways, but generally speaking, the more active, the better. There's one over there. Yeah. <coughs> Is a hypercalcification of, of uh, blood vessels in the brain associated with cognitive decline, as shown in the scan, for instance? Okay. Uh, that would be off-piste for me, but we have shown in some of our imaging studies that the collection of certain types of mineral in the brain is associated with slightly lower cognitive function, but that's, again, slightly off-piste for me and highly, highely specialised. It would be here, in the carotids. How far are you liaising across the country? How many other teams are doing this sort of thing? Okay. So we're working in the Edinburgh area. There are teams following up Scottish mental surveys and smaller studies in Aberdeen, a smaller team there. And there are also folks following up, as Jude mentioned earlier on, the 1946 birth courts, 1958, the 1970 as well. So there are others. And also there are others internationally too, and we keep in touch with their sorts of findings too. And it's quite often the case that we, when it comes to, say, genetic studies, we don't have enough in any one study to do something. We need to join up and form consortia with other groups. Sometimes these go up to dozens of studies combining their data together. Yep. I have a question. Thank you for a great talk. Um, you ask a question, what else, quite often. So what else beyond kind of IQ or cognitive tests at age 11 can predict later aging. And most of the answer that you provided happen in adulthood or in later in life, diet, smoking, exercising. Is there in anything else at age 11? What else at age 11 or in childhood? Yeah, yeah, sure. We're not brilliantly placed to do that because we've got this big gap between age 11 and older age, but some, some of it we can collect retrospectively. So let me just give you one example. In fact, yes, there is the case because the original brain size contributes as well, so that's fixed quite early on, and education has a wee effect as well. So however bright you are, a bit of education seems to give you that bit of a boost for cognitive function as well. So this is truly a life course study, but I emphasise we've got this gap as well, part of which we can collect retrospectively. We're also in the business now of collecting people's lifetime addresses and we've got geographers who are geocoding all these addresses to get the cumulative environmental insults and that will be out in the next few years. There's one there, I think we've already got the mic, hands going up all over. Thank you very much. Interesting in um, bilingualism, 
if you have any um, comment on that. Thank you very much. Say again. Bilingualism. Bilingualism, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. That came out in Annals of Neurology last year, and what we found was that those people who had more than one language, and especially those who used it actively, seemed to have a slightly better cognitive function in older age than, in, than you would have expect, given their, their ability. The unusual aspect we had was we could look at how they scored prior to acquiring the second language, which is an unusual advantage. Okay, there was one there. There's a lady there with a the mic. Examples go on to develop any serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, and did that show up in any of your tests later on in life? Right. This is a really good question for the, not the reason you asked. None of them. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's just scientific code for I'm going to answer a different question. Right. So none of them had schizophrenia. However, one thing we did that we were the first group to do this, and it wasn't me, it was one of my postdoctoral students did it. We looked at their over half a million genetic markers. And although none of them ever developed schizophrenia, we could calculate how loaded they were genetically to get schizophrenia, even though they never, get, even though they never got it, right? And those people who were more loaded towards the genetics of schizophrenia, even although they never got it, had slightly lower cognitive function in older age than you would expect. So a very unusual finding. Okay, so there's one line there, and I think the mic is back here somewhere. Yeah, you want to go first, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, is this down? Yeah. It's really a general comment. Your, your um, uh, mention of television. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you can put it down. I mean, I work very hard. I'm very engaged, and then I get very tired. I'm sure we're aware of that. And it's the relaxation. I mean, you don't have to watch rubbish. There's lots of really good stuff on TV. But it's to the, the, be able to relax and also engage. I find it very valuable. And I, I get fed up with people always down on TV. It's, you know... <laughs> Do, do you know what I'm, do, I don't know, I'm sure okay. some, pe somebody well, Can I you. speak up for rubbish, please? Uh, <laughs> I will be missing MasterChef The Professionals when I travel back to Edinburgh tomorrow night, so I'm, I'm fairly annoyed at that. It's a little bit of rubbish, even. Yeah, not, not yeah, too much. It's, not rubbish, it's so actually. tedious, it's isn't it? But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Across the spectrum. I'm not posh enough not to have a television. <laughs> Could you say... Um, something about how you found, how you went about tracing people yes, to surely. It, it, and also how many, what proportion were dead and what proportion surely. Uh, wouldn't Great question. So the way you go about tracing them is this. You ask the chief area medical officer to write on your behalf to people on what's called the Community Health Index, which is the register of people registered with a GP, which is like 99% of people. And they, the community health officer says, there's a bloke called Professor Deary that thinks he might have taken part in this study at age 11, would like to follow you up now, get in touch if you're interested. Right, second question, that's how you get in touch, basically. I've kind of underestimated that because it takes a long time to get permission to do all that, and it's a long process, but at the same time, Who's alive? The, now, we asked that same question, Professor Lo, uh, Lawrence Wally and I, early on in our studies, and we said, when we're calling people back for these studies, we're finding out who's alive and who's dead. And one of our first papers was in the British Medical Journal, where we showed that people who scored better on this mental test at age 11 were much more likely to be alive in their mid-70s. And that's carried on since then. We've continued this line of work, and I haven't even touched on that tonight, and it's called cognitive epidemiology, the association between youthful cognitive ability and mortality, longevity, whether you want to be negative or positive about it. Super couple of questions there. Yeah. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, have you done any studies that relate to whether meditation plays any part on cognitive ability later on in life? And the second is, um, in relation to the uh, connection between white matter, um, so scarring of the, of the brain, and um, cognitive ability, um, I ask that from a personal um, perspective. My mum has lots of um, scarring due to migraines and TIAs. Is there anything that can uh, be done to support sort of, I don't know, um, repairing of that white matter? Or is it then sort of stuck in the brain as, a, you know, as, as an issue? 
fair enough. The, first, the answer to the first question is no. And the answer to the second question is, with regard to intervention, that's again off-piste for me, but again, gen general health, there is this adage which says what's good for the heart is good for the brain as well. So looking after cardiovascular health wouldn't be a bad place to, to start there. I wish we had. I do wish we had detailed data on people's head trauma over the years and rugby playing and that type of thing. We just simply don't have it. But one spends one's life in terms of being a director of a cohort, regretting all the things that you don't have and not really paying so much attention to the thousands and thousands of things that you, you, you do have as well. But that's a, a good point, and that would be a useful thing to know as well. Um, this lady and then there's a gent at the back there. You said you'd talk about low anaesthetic load. Yes. So, anaesthetic load is, again, a scientific buzzword, but it, it describes this. It describes a body that succumbed more to wear and tear, and we discover it by measuring a certain number of things. How many inflammation chemicals there are in the blood, how bad one is at looking after glucose in the bloodstream, how heavy one is, whether one's got high blood pressure, whether one has a lot of the stress hormone cortisol, and all these things go together to indicate a body that is more or less worn and torn, and that's allostatic load. And we want to have a body that's got a low allostatic load and has got the good measure of all these things. And that allostatic load is related to cognitive function and brain health, and we've published a couple of reports on that. First of all, may I wish you a happy St Andrew's Day. Um, my question is, um, have you or has anybody carried, carried out any detailed studies on the relationship between musical uh, activity and ability and uh, retention of cognitive ability in older, older age? Yeah, the, 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 again, this, this is a bit off piece for me, but the, with regard to older age, I'm not so sure, but there's a lot of interest in things like musical practice and whether it enhances some of the white matter connections in the brain. And there's also quite big studies showing that people who are doing better at musical capability, also tend to be slightly better at general cognitive ability as well. But with regard to the preservation of these sorts of things, it's a kind of funny thing as well, because although one might think that, I, again, I'm, I'm speaking as a layperson myself now, that, that playing, say, a musical instrument might in fact be a good way of keeping oneself going, I play uh, the, 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 the soprano saxophone in a band, and I find I'm doing it best when I don't think. If I try and think a solo out, I will, cock it, I will make a mistake. Uh, <laughs> if I just let my fingers do it, I'll be fine. So I think it's quite crystallized by the time you've got to my stage rather than fluid. Uh, that is, it's to do more with knowledge than it is to do with raw thinking power. But maybe learning a new one would be the thing. My question was, uh, was very similar, actually. Now I've got a generation of uh, older rock stars who've been playing uh, kind of life of the century yeah. and rock and rolls, and they're still playing during the 70s. So uh, I wonder how much uh, creativity coming to the yeah. of musicians or who the musical when they're 11. Yeah. Who the Okay, I'm going to be really controversial. I think it's just more of the same. I think I think if you looked at a uh, I'm very, very interested in music and, and, and not least rock music and uh, dance music. And I think most people's first three or four albums are pretty inventive and good. And then they tend to get a bit repetitive after that. Yeah, I think they, they burn out quite quickly. Yeah, unlike poets. Did, did, did you make a note of gender differences in cognitive, when you were measuring cognitive ability? Yes. I don't know that I have the the final sort of summary meta-analysis systematic review on this. But one thing we did find that was interesting in the Lothian birth court of 1921, so the really the older people, was that compared to cognitive function in youth, the men were doing slightly better at age about 80 that, that, than the women, but there was no difference in youth. And, and we did think that might be a survivor thing insofar as it's harder to, to get to be an 80-year-old man in Scotland than it is to get to be an 80-year-old woman. There, there, are, there are fewer of the men, so they might be sort of super survivors. You get the idea. Because women live about seven years longer than, than men. Well, the advice clearly that you've kind of given us is to start well at the age of 11. How does one achieve a good start at 11? Because it plainly is decisive in one's later um, development. Sure. Well, I'm not going to hide the fact that 
the genetic complement is going to contribute some of it, but by no means all of it. The environment is going to contribute as well. And the conference that was being held today, Closer, who kindly invited me to give the, the public talk at the end of it, were talking about that more, more than I do. So there are lots of cohorts in the UK that can contribute to that more knowledgeably than I can. I kind of start at age 11 and then move forward from that. But yeah, I, I agree entirely. The early years, of which there's a great deal of interest, are, are obviously important. And, and getting you to a nice high baseline, so that even if you slip, you're not slipping down to such a low level, level later on. I thought we might have reached some natural... That's not bad. That's not bad. Still only five to eight. Thank you all. Um, I just wondered why Scotland had done the test. Oh, right. Do you want to hear that? To that OK, so here we go. Conclude, For two different reasons. The 1932 survey was done under the International Examinations Inquiry. This is a combination of European and North American uh, countries who got together, funded by Carnegie, because they were worried. They were worried about school examinations and fairness. And they gathered first in 1931 at a hotel in Eastbourne, and it's all men, and they gave each country a research project and at that time, there were these newfangled things called IQ tests. And Scotland said, it'd be quite interesting just to test the entire nation's intelligence, just to find out how many folk were at the top and at the bottom, so we could plan for schooling for special people at the top and at the bottom. That was the first survey. Second survey, a bit different. The second survey was run under the auspices of the Population Investigation Committee of the United Kingdom. And it was worried. And it was worried because of the differential birth rate. That is, that the lower classes were having more children and having their children younger than the middle professional classes. And they were worried that the nation's intelligence was going to decline because of this. And so they said, where can we test this terribly worrying idea? Scotland. Scotland <laughs> tested its entire nation's IQ born in 1921 and 19, in 1932. So let's test them all again, 15 years later, born in 1936, and test them in 1947. Give them exactly the same test, and because it's the entire population, we can make no mistakes with regard to sampling, and guess what they found? They found that the second survey showed not a decrease, a very slight increase, Flynn effect, folks. Anyway, a very slight increase. So from 1947, it's been permissible in the United Kingdom for working class families, like my own family, to have children. And uh, it's been OK, uh, sanctioned uh, since then. So there you go, two very, very different reasons. And isn't it amazing that that second survey was done for that reason after the Second World War? It's extraordinary. But anyway, what a legacy they gave us with regard to studying cognitive ageing. That was the reason they did them. Can we just thank Ian again for a fantastic stimulating <laughs> Thank you.